Early in the morning of May 24th, 1941, the battleship Bismarck and the escorting cruiser Prince Eugen, under the overall command of Admiral Gunther Luchens, are making their way through the Denmark Strait in an attempt to break into the Atlantic to attack British shipping. Trailing behind them are the British heavy cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk, which have been shadowing the German ships since the previous day, just far enough to be outside the range of Bismarck's guns. However, closing in on the two German ships are two large British capital ships, the brand new HMS Prince of Wales equipped with 10 14-inch guns, and the large HMS Hood, the pride of the Royal Navy, equipped with 8 15-inch guns. Soon, the pride of the Royal Navy would be at the bottom of the sea. The German ship's journey began several days earlier, leaving from Danzig and making their way through the Kattegat, the narrow passage between Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, proceeding through the North Sea, around Iceland, and into the Denmark Strait. For the Royal Navy, the first intelligence of the German breakout would come on the 20th when Swedish observers reported Bismarck's passage through the Kattegat. In the following day, a Spitfire would report the presence of two cruisers in Grimstad Fjord near Bergen. Admiral Tovey, the commander-in-chief of the home fleet, thought Luchens would take advantage of some foul weather and make the breakout into the Atlantic, one of two ways, either through the Iceland Faroes Gap or around Iceland and through the Denmark Strait. The latter was the more likely path the German ships would take, as it was safer, being farther away from the British Isles and therefore harder for the British to observe their movements. Tovey would dispatch ships to watch these entrances into the Atlantic sending the heavy cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk to watch the Denmark Strait. In the meantime, not knowing if Luchens had sailed as he had not received the report of the Spitfire pilot, he ordered the Hood and Prince of Wales west, hedging his bets that Luchens would use the Denmark Strait, and Tovey would sail with the home fleet once it was clear that Luchens had sailed, which was confirmed on the 22nd of May. Tovey would sortie with King George V, the battle cruiser Repulse, and the aircraft carrier Victorious. And by then, Hood and Prince of Wales were over 500 miles away. On HMS Hood, commanding the force, was Admiral Lancelot Holland, who had already seen battle previously in the Mediterranean under Admiral Somerville during the Battle of Cape Spartivento. Somerville and his subordinates, including Holland, had been criticized for being overcautious and not pursuing the Italian ships. Keep this in mind, as it will be an important factor in the battle. By the evening of the 23rd of May, as HMS Suffolk turned on a southward course on her patrol in the Denmark Strait, at 7.22 p.m., a lookout spotted a large gray ship emerging from the mist and fog. By 8 that evening, both Norfolk and Suffolk were shadowing the two German ships, staying close enough to track them through the fog banks and snow showers, while remaining outside of Bismarck's gun range. Holland on the Bridge of Hood, around 300 miles out, with Bismarck almost due north of him, decided to increase speed and turn to the northwest to cut Bismarck off. This decision was made with Churchill in mind, who preferred an admiral that kept to the tradition of the service and was aggressive in their actions. Holland could have continued on a westward course and met Bismarck and Prince Eugen in the North Atlantic. Instead, he chose to turn and engage the enemy, in the process directing the captain of Prince of Wales, John Leach, to follow his movements, and the two large ships maneuvered through the Arctic night. The next morning, with the sun already risen, the opposing ships were 32,000 yards away at 5.35 a.m. In World War II at Sea by Craig L. Simmons, he writes, On board the Prince of Wales, the ship's chaplain, W.G. Parker, read a prayer over the ship's loudspeaker. It was a prayer that had been offered by parliamentary forces at the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. O Lord, thou knowest how busy we must be today. If we forget thee, do not thou forget us. Admiral Holland would open up the battle at 5.52 a.m., firing a salvo at the lead ship in the German formation, which must have been misidentified as Bismarck, but it was actually the Prince Eugen. Bismarck would soon be correctly identified, and the Prince of Wales would shift their focus. While well, Hood kept tracking the lead ship Prince Eugen, and she likely shifted her fire from Prince Eugen to Bismarck during the battle, to what effect or to what time this occurred, both are uncertain. After her first salvo, the Prince of Wales would suffer from mechanical problems. It would hamper her ability to fight. The Germans would begin to open fire at about the same time as the Prince of Wales, and at 5.55 a.m., Hood and Prince of Wales executed a turn of 20 degrees to port to bring their after guns into play, as only their forward guns would bear at the angle of the early engagement. It should be noted that both sides were exchanging salvos during this time. The third salvo from Bismarck would hit Hood's boat deck near the mainmast, and a fierce fire would break out because of it. 
At around 6 a.m., as the British were making another 20-degree turn, when Bismarck's fifth salvo hit Hood, one or two shells fell in the area of the boat deck and possibly near or below the waterline. Hood would erupt with flames and explode, break in two, and go down within three minutes. There's some evidence to say Hood fired her after 15-inch guns, just before the explosion or simultaneously with it. Following the destruction of the Hood, both Prince Eugen and Bismarck concentrated their fire on the Prince of Wales. In the process, they hit the Prince of Wales several times, including the bridge, killing a majority of those in it. However, during the battle, the Prince of Wales scored two hits on Bismarck, flooding a boiler room, reducing speed, causing oil leaks, and putting the ship two degrees down by head. A couple minutes after 6 a.m., the Prince of Wales disengaged and turned away from the German ships, with the Germans electing to go on the same course rather than finishing off the Prince of Wales. The Battle of the Denmark Strait is an incredibly fascinating subject, with many controversies around it. We could spend an extended period of time looking at the battle and its details, but I just wanted to give a general sense of the engagement, as I want to spend more time looking at the loss of Hood. To preface this part in the video as a whole, I am certainly no historian or expert in the field. There are many different theories about how and where Hood was hit. As I have said in previous videos, please do your own research and look into the subject, as there are a wide variety of sources to look at. For this part, I will be getting a lot of my information from R.A. Burt's British Battleships 1919-1945, Bruce Taylor's The Battlecruiser HMS Hood, an illustrated biography 1916-1941, and the HMS Hood Association. For the next part, we will look at the Board of Inquiry's final report and some of the witnesses of the event. Let's take a look at an account of one of her surviving crew, Ted Briggs, an ordinary signalman who was on the bridge at the time of the explosion, where he says, After the initial jarring, she listed slowly, almost hesitatingly to starboard. She stopped after about 10 degrees when I heard the helmsman's voice shouting up the voice pipe to the officer of the watch. Steering's gone, sir. The reply of very good showed no signs of animation or agitation. Immediately, Kerr ordered change over to emergency steering. Although the hood had angled to starboard, there was still no concern on the compass platform. Holland was back in his chair, looking aft towards the Prince of Wales, and then trained his binoculars on the Bismarck. Slowly, the hood righted herself. Thank heaven for that, I murmured to myself, only to be terrorized by her sudden, horrifying cant to port. On and on she rolled until she reached an angle of 45 degrees. After this, Briggs made his way out of the compass platform, along with everyone else who could, except for Holland and Kerr. Briggs continued to move along the Admiral's Bridge, and Hood was almost on her beam ends. He was halfway down the ladder when he washed into the sea, with a long ordeal ahead of him. He continues, This was it, I realized, but I wasn't going to give in easily. I knew that the deck head of the compass platform was above me, and that I must try to swim away from it. I managed to avoid being knocked out by the steel stanchions, but I was not making any progress. The suction was dragging me down. The pressure on my ears was increasing each second, and panic returned in its worst intensity. I was going to die. I struggled madly to heave myself up to the surface. I got nowhere. Although it seemed an eternity, I was underwater for barely a minute. My lungs were bursting. I knew that I just had to breathe and I opened my lips and gulped in a mouthful of water. My tongue was forced to the back of my throat. I was not going to reach the surface. I was going to die. I was going to die. As I weakened, my resolve left me. What was the use of struggling? Panic subsided. I had heard it was nice to drown. I stopped trying to swim upward. The water was a peaceful cradle. I was being rocked to sleep. There was nothing I could do about it. Good night, mum. Now I lay me down. I was ready to meet God. My blissful acceptance of death ended in a sudden surge beneath me, which shot me to the surface like a decanted cork in a champagne bottle. I wasn't going to die. I wasn't going to die. I trod water as I panted in great gulps of air. I was alive. Briggs, Ted Tilburn, and William Dundas, the three surviving members of Hood's crew, found themselves on what would have been the port side of Hood. And below them, the pride of the Royal Navy and over 1,400 men were sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Following the battle, a board of inquiry was set up, and it was accepted that no witness to the scene could be 100% certain of what happened. But the only certain fact was that a major explosion was in the area of the mainmast of the evidence presented. Let's start with HMS Suffolk and Norfolk, which at a distance of 28 miles and 15 miles respectively, it was quite difficult to see but a general impression from the ships is as follows. A fire in the after part of the ship burnt with a clear reddish flame, and it appeared to die down and then increase. 
This was followed shortly by a big explosion which took the form of a high sheet of flame, shaped like a fan or inverted cone. Clouds of dark smoke surrounded this flame and disappeared. Several witnesses claimed seeing a ball or multiple balls of fire showing in the flame of the explosion. As for the Prince of Wales, although being close, many observers could not get a clear-cut impression as they were currently engaged with the German ships. What was clear was that a fire had started on the port side of the boat deck of Hood after the third or fourth salvo from Bismarck. Opinions differed to whether it originated fore or aft of the main mast. Most likely, it was aft, although it spread quickly, with those describing this fire and the latter fire appearing to be different in color. Some observers suggested that the first fire was akin to a gasoline fire, while the latter fire to those who had witnessed cordite fires said it looked like that. As for the explosion, we'll take a look at the account of Captain John Leach of the Prince of Wales. He says, I happened to be looking at Hood at the moment when a salvo arrived, and it appeared to be across the ship somewhere about the main mast. In this salvo, there were, I think, two shots short and one over, but it may be the other way around. But I formed the impression at that time something had arrived on board Hood in a position before the mainmast and slightly to starboard. It was not a very definite impression I had, but it was sufficient to make me look at Hood for a further period. I wondered what the result was going to be, and between one and two seconds after I formed that impression, an explosion took place in the Hood, which appeared to me to come from very much the same position in the ship. There was a very fierce upward rush of flame, the shape of a funnel, a rather thin funnel, and almost instantaneously the ship was enveloped in smoke from one end to the other. Many other witnesses associated this explosion with cordite. Another interesting note is that one of the witnesses was positive he saw a complete 15-inch gun turret with two guns and a single gun in the air. And five other witnesses claimed to have seen either a single 15-inch gun or part of the gun house of a turret in the air. Following the explosion, no witness could get a completely clear picture of Hood as she was enveloped in smoke. To make things even more confusing, witnesses state that Hood had just fired A, B, X, and possibly Y turret, as I previously mentioned, which could also cause fierce flames and smoke. Because of the mismatch of evidence from the differing witnesses reporting to the Board of Inquiry, the cause of Hood's destruction could not be determined definitely. Technical witnesses presented evidence that showed it was obvious that she had been sunk by Bismarck's 15-inch shell, which had struck her in or around the area of the mainmast. However, what it was that caused the tremendous explosion was uncertain. Did the 15-inch shell pierce the upper armor belt or enter through the decks? And in what area did it land? It is something that will probably never be fully answered. In the after area of the ship, there were 15-inch and 4-inch magazines and torpedo warheads, which could have exploded, causing a chain reaction, but the torpedo warhead detonation theory is not exactly sound, as technical witnesses provided 15 points showing how it was unlikely. The board's conclusions, which were submitted on the 12th of September, 1941, are as follows. 1. The sinking of the hood was due to a hit from Bismarck's 15-inch shell in or adjacent to the hood's 4-inch or 15-inch magazines, causing them all to explode and wreck the after part of the ship. The probability is that the 4-inch magazine exploded first. 2. There is no conclusive evidence that one or two torpedo warheads detonated or exploded simultaneously with the magazines or at any other time but the possibility cannot be entirely excluded. We consider that if they had done so, their effect would not have been so disastrous as to cause the immediate destruction of the ship. On the whole, we are of the opinion that they did not. 3. That the fire that was seen on Hood's boat deck, and in which UP and or 4-inch ammunition was certainly involved, was not the cause of her loss. The Board of Inquiry's report can be found in British Battleships 1919-1945 and the HMS Hood Association's website. As I mentioned, there are many theories about how Hood sank, including, but not limited to, magazine detonation of the 4-inch ammunition, 15-inch ammunition, or a combination of the two, with the ready-use 4-inch ammunition lockers playing some role, detonation of torpedo warheads in the area of the mainmast, a cordite flash explosion akin to that of the British battlecruisers at Jutland, high explosive shells from the Prince Eugen causing extreme fires, or 8-inch shells penetrating the deck, or somehow going down Hood's aft funnel, causing the destruction of the ship. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of the various theories, I'm merely presenting them, and I am not trying to prove or justify any of them, as that's not what this video is about, as the origin of the explosion is still up for debate, and there will always be doubt about a definite answer. I will not be giving a personal opinion about the cause of the sinking of HMS Hood, as I have no technical expertise and therefore do not have a valid opinion on the matter. 
It should be noted that the wreck of Hood was found and examined in 2001, but did not provide any concrete evidence as to exactly where Bismarck's 15-inch shells pierced the armor of Hood. For more information on that, take a look at the HMS Hood Association's website. But I hope you all have enjoyed this look at the sinking of HMS Hood and the various different theorized ways she could have been sunk. There's certainly more details to be presented about this subject, and I encourage you to look into it. As this subject can cause serious arguments, let's try to all be civil down in the comments. Please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, thanks for watching and have a great day.